Lupe is uh, is ready. Uh, Lupe, could you just give us uh, a communications check one more time? Yeah, we're not we're not receiving your audio. Let me see if I can get IT to uh, run over and see if we can give you some some help. All right, Lupe, um, IT is going to come over and see if they can provide some assistance to get your microphone working properly. Um, but again, I don't want to <clears throat> be disrespectful to the committee's members' time. So, okay, great. And uh, and Brick is going to set up in the conference room, Lupe. So that is our uh, our plan B, or maybe now our plan A. Uh, you can feel free to join him in the conference room and, and use that same uh, computer. Um, if the uh, chair wishes to uh, kick off the meeting, um, IT is ready to start recording and, and streaming, and we can do so. Okay, for the record, Don Taylor, chair of the Measure U Oversight Committee, we're opening the meeting at 2.07 p.m. on December 3rd. Roll call. Um, Diaz Conti, I don't think that person is here, right? No, I don't think so. Mendez? Present. Mm -hmm. Laris? Present. They could hear Scribner. you at the beginning. Scribner? Oh, you're lighting up there. Let me forget. Uh, uh, Scribner is present. Thank you. Taylor, present. Thank you, thank you, Chair. So we have a record of four members present, uh, one absent, and I will also note that uh, Curtis, I know you're attempting to help out Lupe, we can hear your voice. Uh, so that was working, thank you for that. Uh, and once again, Lupe, the city manager has set up in a large conference room. So if you wish to join them there, if there's any ongoing issues with your audio, please feel free to do that. Okay. Uh, thank you, apologies for the interruption. Okay, and um, I'm not aware of any public comment, so do we proceed to the presentation at this point? I have a question. Um, do we need to reelect officers again because we've had a change of membership? That's an interesting question. I haven't reviewed that 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 issue in the bylaws, but I wouldn't think so at this time, nor would it be appropriate as it's not an agendized item. Okay. Okay, so um, is there any more comment from anybody present? I have a question. Are we going to be doing these quarterly like we had originally, Don, when we were on the uh, on the panel? Were we doing it, you know, every you know quarterly or is it going to be a one time once a year? I'm just curious. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, if I, if I may be able to put some context in uh, the, the moving forward with the Measure U Committee and how we intend to uh, leverage your expertise and participation. Um, yeah, I think. Um, you know, in the past, um, it took a while to get this uh, rolling and, and then it was somewhat um, uh, infrequent and it was pretty put narrow scope. And so what we've endeavored to do is um, preload quarterly meetings that coincide with um, HDL and you'll meet Brett Plumley pretty soon, who is our um, a liaison uh, who does um, our in-depth analysis of our, our tax uh, collection and also um, and makes projections and forecasting around um, all of our, our revenue through tax, including Measure U. The other thing we've done um, in the past is we've uh, not really assigned um, Measure U um, revenue uh, to any of the allocations that were in the original resolution. There was 
four or five, some of there was five elements there. So in this past budget, um, we um, we built a budget and we coded um, budget items that were consistent with what was uh, um, a part of a commitment in the Measure U uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, um, again, marry those two things up, the expenses associated and identified and targeted against Measure U, but also um, um, and marry that up with our, our quarterly um, our tax reporting. Just, just keep in mind that um, every time we get these updates, it's for the, the quarter prior. So we we'll still have um, three months that will not be, um, um, I guess, analyzed. And so um, that will change dramatically what we've done in the past. Um, and we're going to pre preload these meetings so that uh, committee members have some anticipation where they're going to be. I hope that addresses uh, that question as well as may maybe some others that committee members had. Okay, yeah, thank you, um, Brick. Um, I do have a question because basically we had a formation meeting, we had a training meeting, and I think we had one actual meeting. Refresh my memory, Sharon. Right. It was yeah. we had over the brown meeting. Ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we really haven't had an opportunity for any ongoing. I think we basically just did a you know training and formation. And everything's been scant because of COVID. So um, we're really starting fresh. And I believe um, Rick wasn't the city manager when we had our two initial meetings. Mm -hmm. So we've had a, and um, Lupe's new, we've had a lot of um, turnover. And I, I assume Mr. Mendez replaced Donna Breeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, a, a great uh, point, Madam Chair. The, um, you know, the, the turnover of two council members means that we have to have two nominations and that took a significant amount of time and then the training and coordination of the training and those type of things really, um, it, I guess, extended that timeline by which we would have uh, a, a quorum and everybody on board ready to go. So, um, you know, that's something we're going to, um, and we have another election coming up and there's potential for new council members and new appointees. But um, you know, with that lesson learned, we're going to put some emphasis on how we accelerate that should council members be replaced and obviously their appointees replaced. Okay, and um, I do like that you've put in the accounting system a coding, a project coding so that um, when we look at the accounting reports, we know what's tied and matched basically. And it looks like you're carrying forward the excess that wasn't budgeted into next year to fund more projects next year. So that looks like a good thing. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, Mr. Connors, this is the first actual operating meeting that uh, we've had because it's been such a long time. We basically only did training. So I really don't even know except for following the agenda, you know, what we're going to be doing going forward. You're, you're going to have to um, lead us. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. And, and are we able to go over the, the expenditures and go and just kind of talk about, you know, uh, measure you projects in progress, the things that have already been done? Uh, because it was my understanding that we were going to be a part of that process before things were done. You know, you're going to, and so things have changed, like Don said. Yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, the, the only distinction is that this is an oversight committee. Um, you're just validating that the, the funds are used um, according to the commitments that were made specific to the resolution. Um, um, the actual uh, the project status and those type of things um, uh, are not necessarily um, within the purview of the oversight committee. It's more of that, that they're used uh, appropriately for the right things. Um, generally speaking though, I, I, I can and will comment on the status of those projects as, uh, as, as they're being executed. Because we do, uh, especially the capital projects, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of the items that were coded um, are personnel, um, additional uh, employees uh, that, um, um, and so, I mean, it's, there's not really much to report. So on the capital projects, we can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, can I uh, ask a question? So in terms of our meetings going forward, I wasn't really clear what you said. My, my understanding of our mandate is to meet every three months and do a yearly report on our findings to the council. Uh, is that what we're going to stick with? That would be the base agenda. Um, quarterly meetings, 
HDL tax revenue review and forecasting. Um, um, and when, while, while we have uh, Mr. Plumley, um, he'll be uh, our H HDL rep representative will be participating in those meetings as well. Um, so we can also provide um, uh, perspective on what other cities do in terms of their oversight committee meetings. And yep. we can expand or contract our agendas based on uh, some input from um, um, uh, other supported agencies that the HDL is involved with. So this is this is um, not a set thing. As a group, we can we can define um, the meetings that we have forward in the agendas, um, and then continue to modify it to uh, it achieves um, your expectations um, within the within the scope of the uh, responsibilities of this committee. So, uh, Mr. Connor, um, I would like to comment when Mr. Butler was the city manager and this committee was formed. Uh, he had said that we would be able to speak in front of the city council, you know, at, as an advisory committee. I, I know our recommendations aren't binding, but to be heard at the budget hearings, um, how, how would that fit in with your vision for our role going forward? Yeah, you know, an advisory, an oversight, uh, um, there's, there's, there's nothing that would prevent me from agendizing a Measure U um, report, whether it's by uh, committee members or by staff. Um, we were discussing with Mr. Butler when this uh, committee was formed originally is that the uh, Measure U members would be able to make a presentation if they like. Um, Mr. Scrivener, do you recall that conversation as well and Sharon? Yes, yes I, I recall the, my understanding was that we were to meet quarterly, um, develop a report that was going to be given to the council by the chairperson once a year. That, that was what I came out of that understanding. Right. And because we're advisory, we would be allowed to like make a presentation at the budget here, kickoff hearings or whatever, so that when they're developing the budget, they could consider what we as an advisory committee recommend. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the way it was put forth to us initially. So I'm thinking- and, and, Yeah, I have, no, I have no issues with that approach or that. Um, I, I have no notes that suggest that's what had been planned, um, but that definitely within within the scope of this committee's uh, responsibilities. Okay. Sharon, is that, is that your recollection also, Sharon? Oh, yeah. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was um, just uh, what I wanted to make sure Mr. Connor knew going forward, because again, we, we really, because of COVID, we haven't really had a chance to have any kind of ongoing meeting. We basically just have formation meetings and we wanted to convey to you, Mr. Connor, that that's what we were um, told would be our role. And I, I believe the Sharon and uh, Mr. Scrivener and myself, that's what we would like to do, at least for the first year. I, I don't recall when are your budget hearings every March? At June? When do you do the budget? You you okay at an end of July, right? Is it right? Yeah, so so our budget is a two-year budget. So um, those meetings occurred in um, July and August of this year past. Um, okay. But we do, we do quarterly updates. So there's nothing um, necessarily um, wrong with um, agendizing um, uh, the committee's um, you know report out of a quarterly meeting. Um, I, I I do think though that um, you know it's almost like watching paint dry, um, and and um, and we we'll, we will give quarterly updates on in terms of financial performance, uh, revenue um, to expense. Then transfers, and it, um, it it is fitting to sync sequence that with any report that the committee would like to um, uh, to uh, inject into that process. Right. So we we would be allowed to maybe make a presentation and agendize it, and possibly mm -hmm. recommend to the council a mid year or mid annual budget adjustments based on. Yes 
our input, you know, uh, you were detailed the projects generally here and the positions, you're mostly funding positions and um, you're correct that um, not too much in capital projects and such, mostly uh, police department positions. So, but that's the purpose is, is what the city's doing in concert with what the um, Citizens Oversight Committee had envisioned. And it is by and large, I would say, but I, I know that um, Sharon and, and David Scrivener, we, we would like to, as forming members, have a chance to make input. Excuse me, committee members. Um, I'm going to have to interject and insist that we follow the agenda. This is a Brown Act committee, and we're obligated to follow the Brown Act. Right now, we are in general public comments. We have not reached presentations. There is no opportunity for discussion. The discussions that are currently taking place would probably be most appropriate under agenda item two during the review of the materials actually presented to you. I'm just trying to avoid us being guilty of a misdemeanor and receiving a Brown Act letter. Okay. Well, let's not get a Brown Act letter. All right. <laughs> flash so, down if you need to. So are we ready then for the HDS presentation? And then, uh, then we'll um, further our discussion uh, regarding expenditures and revenue uh, when we get to the next item, okay? So are we ready for a HDS to do the presentation or? Let's Brett, go. Brett, do you want to start sharing your screen? Sure, I will do that. I just want to um, just quickly introduce myself, and I do that in the presentation as well. But I met um, three of you, ironically, about a year and a half ago. I, I right. participated or I went with Lloyd DeLamas, and he made a presentation to your oversight committee. And I've been with HDL a little more than two years now. So here I am, full circle back and, and meeting with all of you again and new members as well, a new city manager, new finance director. And I'm happy that I can participate in, and share information with you today. So let me share my screen and bring up the PowerPoint. Can you see that? Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do it as a slideshow. Okay, here we go. So this is um, the, we're presenting to, and I understand this is the Measure U Oversight Committee, and I have information included to give you today on historical information on Measure W, because it's, it's uh, related, very related, and we will go through that, and I'll take any questions that you have as we go through the presentation. And I'm Brett Plumley, and I've been, worked in the, previously worked in the public sector for over 35 years. I worked in seven different cities. I was city manager. I retired two years ago, a little more than two years ago, city of Los Alamitos. I was city manager there for six years. I was city manager in La Puente before that for two and a half years. And I also worked in La Quinta, El Segundo, Rolling Hills Estates, also La Mirada and Costa Mesa. So I have always been on the client side of cities working with HDL as you are doing now I'm on this side as a consultant so I always wanted to go work with HDL at the tail end of my municipal career and fortunately I'm able to do that and, and I'm here and I and I get to meet with 40 plus cities every single quarter Fort Wyneme is one of my cities and it's really um, a fun job that I have and I learn a lot from all of the cities and I'm happy to be able to share what I've learned over the years as well. So we're, um, HDL has been in existence now for more than 37 years. And just to highlight, we we're proud that we have been able to maintain a 99% client retention. And we have more than 500 municipal clients at this point in time. Lloyd DeLamas met with you and when I was there about a year and a half ago, it's, it's actually more like two years, it's right before the pandemic began. And Lloyd actually, along with Bob Hinderleiter, founded the company. So Lloyd DeLamas is um, definitely one of the, the keystones of the company. Now, just to get into the data here, this is your sales tax breakdown. And in Port Wyneme, your sales tax rate 
is eight and three quarters percent. And you can see here included is the state's portion, the county's portions, and then you'll both your Bradley Burns, you receive 1% of all of the sales tax that's generated in your city. And you have the two measures, the transaction and use tax measures, measures W that was implemented first, that was implemented all the way back in um, fiscal year 2008, 2009. And then your measure U, most recent measure that started back in fiscal year 18, 19 at 1%. So you have a total of one and a half percent that is being collected on your behalf in transaction and use tax. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through the slides here and just educate the committee on what consists of transaction and use tax, how it came about and how it is divided basically and recorded in Port Wainimi. So the, this one slide just shows that the number of TUT districts throughout the state of California have continued to grow. And you can see back in 2013, 177, all the way to 406 through November 2020. That's the historical information that we have in this particular slide. The highlight is that 95% of the state's population live in one or more of the transaction and use tax districts. And so when, People ask the question, and you may have questions about, is there a competitive disadvantage for having a transaction and use tax? In your case, you have two. And I would say primarily, no, there's not. Um, I have a slide coming up here to talk about that, but because as you can see, 95% of the state's population live in one or more districts, there's really not a competitive disadvantage. It may have been more of an issue early on, early implementation back in 2012, 2013, but it's really no longer an issue. The, the who and where, there's more than half of the counties throughout the state of California are in a transaction and use tax and almost half of all of the cities also are in that. In Northern California, there are more districts than in Central and Southern California. But the point is this is to supplement that last slide that most of either cities or counties are in one or more transaction and use tax districts. This is the particular, the revenue and taxation code section 7251 that allows the implementation of a transaction and use tax. And it's been called a district tax or an add-on tax. You often hear those terms thrown out there, but mainly we're talking about transaction and use tax. And then just talk about functional differences. When you compare the 1% sales tax that Port Wainimi that you receive from people that shop within the city boundaries, you're getting a 1% of all of the sales tax that's generated. And then additionally, you are receiving the transaction and use tax, which is both the measures W and measure U on various different types of purchases. And I'm gonna go through and try to demonstrate some examples of how the different purchases are calculated and how Port Wainimi, how you receive these dollars. But as I was talking, I've talked with, with Brick and with Lupe about this, the real story in Port Wainimi is um, a lot of, on the sales tax end and on the transaction use tax end, a lot is cannabis related, a very high percentage of all of the sales and use tax that's generated is coming from that one source. And the other key piece of the story is a lot of your transaction and use tax is imported from cities surrounding Port Wainimi. So you're more of a, the, you know, the, the mom and pop type stores where the retail stores get categorized as general consumer goods, you're collecting sales tax, you get the 1% from the sales tax generated within your city. And then additionally, you're receiving transaction and use tax on both measure U and measure W from outside of the city. So you have some pretty big cities surrounding you and your residents are shopping there and you're benefiting from the transaction and use tax that you received one and a half percent. When we're, when we're looking at the seven different major industry groups, and that's how we at HDL analyze 
and forecast your sales tax and your transaction and use tax. The main difference is to highlight here um, between the Bradley Burns and other types of retailers, you get primarily one for one transaction tax, one equal to your Bradley Burns, that 1% you receive from grocery stores, from restaurants, and from gas stations you're primarily, it's a one for one, where you're receiving more than 100% are in the different sectors and industry groups like autos and transportation, general consumer goods, business and industry, and you're getting some dollars also from petroleum type products. Uh, so that's the highlight here. And then to give you some specific examples, the this example here, we're talking about automobiles. So you don't have auto dealers in the city of Port Wyneme. You're not receiving sales tax from auto um, sales. But what you are doing in this particular example is the, the buyer, you go out and purchase a vehicle and you live, if you live in a city that does not have a transaction and use tax, and that particular city has a total sales tax rate of eight and three quarters percent, that buyer is paying only the seven and a quarter percent because there is no transaction and use tax. And so wherever that particular consumer buys that vehicle within that city, that city will receive the 1% Bradley Burns portion. In the next example, which is really the example that is pertinent to Port Wyneme, the buyer lives in a city that does have a transaction and use tax. Like in Port Wyneme, you have measure W with the half percent, you have measure U with the 1%. So it's a total of one and a half percent. So you have a resident that lives in Port Wyneme and they go and purchase a vehicle in a surrounding city that has an auto dealer that particular city will get the Bradley Burns portion. They will get the 1% sales tax and Port Wyneme will get the one and a half percent transaction and use tax. So it's based on where the vehicle is registered. And in this case, if it's registered and purchased by a resident in Port Wyneme, you receive the one and a half percent transaction and use tax. This example is on deliveries and, and the different types of purchases that I highlight here, building supplies, equipment, and bulk fuel. And these are primarily being imported into your city. This is an example of, you, you do not have a, a real um, high percentage of sales tax dollars that you are receiving in these types of purchases from building supplies, equipment, and bulk fuel. So if the product gets delivered into the city of Port Wyneme, then you are collecting the transaction and use tax. And if it's outside the city, there is no transaction and use tax. And that's what this is designed to highlight for those types of purchases made. And this one, what I wanna highlight here is online sales and just keeping in mind that there are where the tax is collected for Amazon and businesses like eBay and Facebook, Wayfair, the transaction and use tax is going directly to Port Wyneme. So if your resident is making an online purchase, you're receiving directly the transaction and use tax from those particular purchases that are made. So you're significantly benefiting, especially in general consumer goods, when we're talking about online sales that are being purchased, you're getting that one and a half percent. And that is because of the, the two transaction and use tax measures that you have with the W and, and U. And this one just shows how much in terms of measure W, and I know the oversight committee's measure U, but this is definitely related because it's half a percent and measure U is 1%. So when we're talking about historical information that has been generated by measure W, it's very applicable to measure U. You're basically taking half of that. The patterns are the same. 
And here we can see Measure W going all the way back to fiscal year 08-09, a 13-year history, and how significant this particular revenue source has grown up to this point in fiscal year 2021. You're over 1.6 million in Measure W dollars, and, and um, the pattern, like I said, with Measure U is half of that but it's only over the past nine quarters that Measure U has been in existence. So we break this out further. Here are the major industry groups. And here you can see on the left side, these are all the, measure, the major industry groups that we at HDL analyze on your behalf, on behalf of all the clients that we have in cities and counties and in terms of transaction and use tax in this case. So food and drugs in Port Wyneme is by far, I mentioned, way up at the top. And that is the industry that contains its grocery stores, drug stores, and cannabis-related businesses. And because that particular business type in your city is generating such a high percentage of all of the sales tax, you're also benefiting on the transaction and use tax. Mainly, it's, it's a one-for-one. One. All the dollars that you receive on the Bradley Burns side, that 1%, you're receiving an equal amount in Measure U because that's 1% and you're getting half of that in Measure W. So you can see at the top of the list here, the two major industry groups are basically tied through fiscal year 2021 are food and drugs because of the cannabis businesses and then general consumer goods. And general consumer goods is so solid because of the combination, I mentioned that you're importing dollars from your residents making purchases outside of the city of Port Wyneme and you're receiving from the online sales that are made in that particular sector the transaction and use tax. And that growth has, you can see the chart here, um, both in terms of really strong growth in food and drugs, starting back in fiscal year 17, 18. And that's because the cannabis programs were implemented in your city at that time. So that is the really steep incline at that point. And then general consumer goods really almost equally strong incline that took place starting at the end primarily of calendar year 2019. And that's when there was a Wayfair decision and AB 147 was the legislation that implemented the Wayfair decision and cities began collecting use tax and sales tax on out-of-state retailers and third-party retailers, and that was AB 147. So that's really accounting for a permanent growth and both in the pool dollars that you receive, but also in transaction and, and use tax dollars that you're receiving right here. So the two are right up at the top of the list, your food and drugs and general consumer goods, and really driving the overall story when we're talking about sales tax and transaction tax. Here, just a further drill down. So we look at the seven major industry groups in the previous slide, and this is all. These are all of the business types within Port Wyneme, and this is Measure W, the half percent, and a 13-year trend. And there's the cannabis that I mentioned began in 2017 with that huge growth since that fiscal year, 17, 18. And then with the, I also mentioned the Wayfair decision is the other party responsible for the significant increase, especially in your general merchandise, which is within your general consumer goods category and really strong growth that took place. And that took started at the end of calendar year 2019. And these trends are, you'll see in a moment, the next few slides are very comparable when we start looking at Measure U. So here, Measure U, it's, it's really, um, it becomes easier to tell the story and compare to the Bradley Burns because you are receiving a 1% 
and that's equal to the Bradley Burns amount. So you get 1% on the Bradley Burns and sales tax, and you get 1% from Measure U, and that is equal amounts. And so what we can see at the top, we have the nine quarter history going all the way back to the second quarter of 19 and the same pattern that I just showed you with measure W can be seen with measure U with food and drugs and general consumer goods right up at the top. Food and drugs, you're receiving basically one for one. You get 1% 1 of the Bradley Burns, you get an equal amount with the food and drugs. Restaurants and hotels, which is this green line here, <laughs> you're also getting a one for one. So it's not only your residents, but anyone else that comes into Port Wyneme, they eat at your restaurant. That particular consumer is going to pay the 1% for the Bradley Burns. So you're going to receive that 1% on the sales tax and you're gonna get the one and a half percent in transaction and use tax. And when we look specifically at measure U, which is your oversight committee, that's really one for one. It's 1% 1 Bradley Burns, it's 1% Measure U, equal amounts for the restaurants, equal amounts for the food and drugs. And most of the other business major industry groups are imported in. So you're getting a significantly higher percentage in transaction use tax in most of the major industry groups than you are on the Bradley Burns. So this is, in, in the case of Port Wyneme, a really significant benefit from having that transaction in use tax because in most cases, you're receiving significantly more than 100% of, of your Bradley Burns amount. This is the drill down further. I showed you the drill down for measure W and now we want, I wanted to put the same thing out here for measure U, even though it's a shorter history. So the, the chart, the patterns look the same. It's just a shorter history. So it only goes back nine quarters to the second quarter of 19. But the story is the same up, up here, you know, cannabis way up at the top. And again, that's the same amount that we were looking at for the on the sales tax side, you're receiving the same amount or of the 1% coming from Bradley Burns as you are the 1% measure you. And it's cannabis started in 2017 and then the Wayfair decision, which had the Marketplace Facilitators Act and the collection of transaction tax and, and use tax from out-of-state retailers and third-party retailers that began back in at the end of 2019. And that pattern is the same as it is for measure W. So here, this, this one demonstrates, I'm, I'm talking about the one for one, and here you can really see it. And there's the food and drugs, which is your top sector, and you're getting exactly the same amount in your 1% Bradley Burns as you are from measure U. And the same thing you can see here with restaurants and hotels, it's a one for one. And this one, it, I like this chart because it just graphically shows you the picture of how significant the import is, in your case, from what you're receiving outside of the city of Port Wyneme. In general consumer goods, it's really highlighted here. So you're, you know, there's your Bradley Burns portion and your general consumer goods is more than double what's coming in from outside, both outside Port Wyneme and from online sales. That Those two factors are contributing to that significant difference. And the same story can be told for business and industry sector, and especially for autos and transportation. And that is because, you know, I mentioned, you don't have the auto dealers in your city and they're all outside of your city and you are receiving the transaction and use tax, one and a half percent every time one of your residents purchases a vehicle outside of Port Wyneme, you're getting the transaction and use tax dollars. That's based on where those vehicles are registered. 
the fuel and service stations, this um, you get some dollars from petroleum type products, which are outside of the city of Port Wayne. I mean, that's why that's not a straight one for one. And then building and construction, it, again, is a sector where you're importing a significant number of dollars coming into the city from outside of the city. So it's really an interesting story that can be told, but I, I really like to focus in on the two parts, cannabis really significantly driving the story in terms of the sales tax and the transaction tax that's generated, and then significant amount of dollars being imported in from outside. That's really what this is all about. And that really is what helps you understand how that, how those dollars are received on the measure you I'll, I'll just I'll pause for a moment. You guys, anybody can interrupt me anytime. You know, I'm really talking the whole time. But um, does anyone have any questions right now? And I can just I can go through the rest of the slides and we can take questions at the end as well. Yeah, I have a question, David Scrivener. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if I go to Camarillo and buy a two by four, um, drag it back home again, basically somewhere along the somebody figures out to charge me a percent and a half on that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay. I noticed on some of the um, uh, slides that you had um, underneath, like if we want to go back, it would say count, count, set, yeah, like count 16, count 94. What does that mean? Uh, th those are the number of um, businesses in that particular, in this case, the, that business type. Oh, so the okay. number of businesses. It's generated, we get the data, we at HDL, we get the data from the CDTFA, California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, mm -hmm. and that's how they account for it. They track it by business type, they track it within the business type within a major industry group, and that's the, the count is coming from that data. Thank you. Okay, sure. And uh, this one is, I talked about this already, but we just in terms of do the question does come up. It used to come up more often. I mean, I know it came up when I was city manager in Los Alamitos. And at the time that city, we were considering whether or not to recommend putting an item on the ballot for a transaction and use tax and, and council members and, and public, they would ask the question, is there an impact? Is there a competitive disadvantage for having a transaction in use tax and maybe the city next door not having one. And we have not seen it. I mean, there, there, there's a slight impact, but we really think it's too small to measure that. And when consumers go out, they're, they're mostly focusing in on that base cost. They're not so much thinking about maybe that additional half percent or 1% and the, the hassle factor, but the hassle factor there, it's just, it's, you, they're not typically going to make a decision on whether to purchase that item based on whether that city has a transaction in use tax or not. So I just want to, I want to highlight that in case you're thinking about that question or that question comes up with staff as well. And then in terms of trends, we put this one in here. I, I, I like to show the really dramatic difference and growth in this case from online sales compared to brick and mortar retail. And you, you hear about, you read about brick and mortar retail fading away and online sales taking over. And in, to, in some respect, this demonstrates that, but what is happening is brick and mortar stores, which are included in the general consumer goods sector those I think that are the most successful reinvent themselves and they become what the pattern has been, the trend has become smaller footprints of stores, more entertainment related, more things to do to interest the consumer. And that very well will help that particular sector grow in the future, but not as much as online sales. So, eight years past, when we're looking at that time period from 2012 to 2020, you can see brick and mortar dropped by almost 
And that same time period, online sales grew by more than 450%. So it's just incredible booming growth from online sales, combination of factors. Consumers have changed their habits. And during the pandemic, especially with shelter in place and people being home, that was contributing even more. There was a significant spike in online sales because all of us stayed home and looked around our houses and bought things. I included, I included in that category. And so that definitely contributed, but primarily as we highlight here in terms of the Marketplace Facilitators Act, AB 147 is really the primary factor that it has permanently contributed in online growth and the use tax dollars that are being captured now. And so we're still at HDL, our long-term forecast for pool dollars growing is 8% all the way out to fiscal year 26, 27. And that's as we're coming out of the pandemic, post pandemic quarters, permanent growth in the pools. So online sales, we if we continue this trend and when we continue this trend outside of this calendar year 2020, we're going to continue to see online sales growing more than the brick and mortar. And the, the biggest sector within brick and mortar that I've talked about a lot today, your general consumer goods, our long-term forecast is only a one and a half percent growth. So as we go out into the future, general consumer goods, fiscal year 25, 26, 26, 27, we have built into our forecast a one and a half percent statewide growth. We, we fine tune it as we do and Brick mentioned, we do quarterly updates. So we're working with your staff and we work with city manager, finance director, and we find out anecdotally, we study, we learn the history, we know what's happening in your city. And I learned the most from the staff in terms of what's happening and, and your staff has been great in educating me. So we take the forecast statewide and we fine tune it to Port Wyneme and we build our long-term forecast on that. And in your case, general consumer goods is way up, um, one of the highest producing sectors, but food and drugs is by far all the way up at the top. When we're looking at percentages, and, and Brick mentioned, we analyze this data, we get the court, quarterly data from CDTFA and it's one quarter back. So the most recent meeting that we just had with Port Wyneme staff, we were looking at second quarter data, but in the second quarter of 21, when we're looking at the percentage on the, on the Bradley Burns side, and it's very comparable on the transaction and use tax side, food and drugs generated almost 40% of all of the sales tax. And within food and drugs, it's the cannabis related businesses that are driving that so that's, I keep going back to that big part of the story, but the second biggest sector in Port Wyneme is restaurants and hotels. And that's, uh, that generated about a fifth of all of the sales tax in the quarter. So it also is a very significant contributor to the sales tax and the transaction and use tax base in Port Wyneme. And that's the way we analyze it. We start at the state level, we look at all the major industry groups that I've shown you today. We look at all the business types within those major industry groups. And then we drill down to your particular city. We find out what's happening and we tell the story. You want to be able to tell the story of the biggest percentage that's being generated. So that's the presentation that I have and the overview that I have on your transaction use tax. Measure U, Measure W, and I'll take any other questions that you might have right now. I am, I, you know, it was interesting when we first started this. I don't know, Don, when we first uh, started this, we were always talking about the one percent. We never thought about the measure, uh, measure W, and measure U together, forming them together. This is the first time I've heard about that. So that was really interesting to me that finally the city's got such a great tax base 
And it all has to do with dispensaries, I think. You know, I, I often said, we don't, we don't have any automobiles. We don't have any, we're not like Ventura or Camarillo Auctionard. So the cannabis dispensaries is what's brought us up out of the red and into the black, which is amazing. Yeah, and, and I know what you're, I know what um, city manager and finance director, and they're on it in terms of uh, analyzing and tracking that particular industry. Because you, we've seen during the COVID time period, um, it coincided with an overall growth in that industry. Cannabis already was starting to grow and, and come online right about the time when Port Wainimi would implemented its program back in 2017 and even 2018 and 2019 prior to COVID beginning back in March of 2020. And then you know, what happened during COVID is businesses like wine type businesses, liquor, cannabis related businesses all did really well. Um, so there was some somewhat of a spike, but also it looks like, and I know your staff is talking, we have um, an entire cannabis division. so in terms of looking at stability in that industry for the future, we're looking at that, we're working with your staff and that will factor into the forecast as we go forward. But you're right, it's, it's definitely a significant part. It's both on the sales tax end and on the transaction and use tax side. Yeah, absolutely. That's great news. Thank you for the presentation. That was very uh, interesting. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'll stop sharing. Okay. And I'll hand it back to, to the chair. Okay, so if there's any more questions from the members, committee members, going once, twice, I guess you need to vote on the um, receiving and filing your presentation. Um, Let's start here. We have uh, Diaz Conti is absent. Mendez, do you approve to receive and file the report? Yes, I do approve. Thank you. Claris? I approve. Scrivener? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Okay, so we're ready for business item number two, um, one, receive and file fiscal year 2020 audited schedule of sources and uses that was on page, let's see. Uh, I'll share my screen so I can put it up. Um, okay. Yeah. Is it page three of five that we received in our package? That's the audited one? It's the audited one, correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, my only comment is, I don't see where that indicates that it's audited. Is that from your CAFR? So this is a, correct, this is a schedule that's included in the CAFR for the fiscal year ending June 30th of 2020. Okay. Um, right. And so just, I wanted to comment on that. Yeah, that this is one of the schedules that the auditors included. Um, and they're going to continue to do that going forward. So we could look at your CAFR online and verify that it's a exact you know, the audited financials. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then I just wanted to mention that um, the, the opinion that we received for this specific year of June 30th, 2020 was an unqualified opinion. So what that means is that the independent auditors, uh, in their judgment, the city's financial statements are fairly and appropriately represented. So they, they got a, a clean opinion, if you will. Thank you. Can you repeat that? Yes, of course. Um, an unqualified opinion, it's what we call a clean opinion. So in the auditor's judgment, um, they um, the city's financial statements are fairly and appropriately represented. So they didn't accept basically what the city presented. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. no. It's, it's an un, it's called an unqualified opinion, but it's a it's a good opinion. So okay. It's a, 
opinion. Yes. It, uh, uh, Mr. Schumer, it, it sounds the exact opposite of what it's supposed to <laughs> communicate. I'm well, to good. Accounting. It means they had no issues when they did the audit. Okay. And I assume good. it was a full audit transaction testing. This, this schedule is part of your comprehensive audit of your citywide financials, correct? Okay, so, so this, this is good to go then. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I have one question regarding it. It says, uh, this is for Measure U. Was any Measure W implemented to any of these um, revenue, any of this revenue? Or is it just strictly Measure U? No, this is strictly Measure U. The Measure W would be in a separate, uh, it would be in the, in the income statement in the CAFR report. It would be part of the revenue, as is Measure W. So all of the revenue is included in the CAFR, but the Measure U is the only one that has a separate schedule. So you specifically called out Measure U um, as a separate schedule and that you derive that data from uh, coding coding your revenue to measure you so you can make a dis standalone display. Correct. But the other other um, measure W and Prop 172 and all that, that's embedded in your general revenue. And it's not, doesn't have a separate schedule is what you're saying. It doesn't have a, a separate schedule. Correct. Uh, okay. Madam Chair, this is the city manager. Uh, could, could I um, uh, ask or indulge you to uh, allow the city attorney to, to put the scope um, specific to measure you in this committee, just so that uh, for new members, um, uh, especially so that we understand what what the uh, the mission of this committee is. Sure. Uh, so I'm Kevin Spalding. I'm the city attorney. And uh, we've discussed this, albeit it seems like several years ago now, regarding what the scope of this committee is. Uh, this committee was created in the Measure U ordinance, the Transactions and Use Tax Ordinance that was approved by the voters. Um, incident to the creation of this committee, the rules defining it were, were put forth in Resolution 4257. And Section 10 of Resolution 4257 states that the scope and duties of the committee are as follows. It says, review revenue and expenditure reports prepared by staff as they relate to the receipt and use of transaction and use tax revenue. Review the independent audit required by section 5614 of the ordinance and prepare a report of its findings for the council. Review and consider reports from the city manager and finance director on operational impact citywide. Review economic trends generally. Provide an annual report to the council on the revenue expenditure history for the prior biennial budget period, including how expenditures align with priorities set by the city manager under the authority of and in keeping with annually established goals of the council. And review staff recommendations to the council on future uses of funds based on revenue and expenditure reports and economic trends. So. Well, I think it's important to understand how Measure W uh, works with respect to, to Measure U and whatnot. This committee's assignment is really only to look at past expenditures of Measure U and prepare guidance on, to the council or report to the council as to whether or not the city has lived up to its representations as to how it would like, how it intended to spend the money. Um, that being said, there's been some discussion earlier on at the creation of this committee on the distinction between a general tax and a special tax. It's important to recognize that Measure U is a general tax. Um, that means that that money can be put to any legal municipal purpose. It is not earmarked for any purposes, even though the ordinance itself called out that there were a series of, of priorities that the council had intended to address during that. So anything that this committee says or reviews in, in an advisory nature or says that we fit or didn't fit within the, the allotted priorities, that's pretty much the end of any authority and whatnot. The council is free to do whatever they choose to with this money and it's simply to look back on past spending and potentially recommend future projects that this committee thinks that the council should be aware of for Measure U expenditures. So um, Lupe, uh, so Measure U is in part of the general purpose revenue uh, on the CAFR? Correct. Okay. It's part of the general fund revenue. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and, and its category in presentation on your financial statements is general purpose taxes. The accounting presentation that aligns with Mr. Spaulding's legal discussion of it. I know uh, HDS talked about um, measure, measure W and all that because it all, all has the same trend analysis because it's all embedded in the general ledger in your general purpose revenue. And so that's that's how the financials that we're looking at align with what Mr. Spaulding said. Is that correct? Can you clarify that for everybody? So we understand why we're, how we're looking at these reports and how you extracted measure U out of the total revenue of the city. I think that would be helpful to the committee members. Right, so the measure U revenue is part of our general fund revenue. And then we have the schedule where we, um, the schedule of sources and uses of funds specifically for measure U, just to identify those expenditures um, that we spend with those dollars. Um, but it's a schedule, it's a separate schedule, it's a supplemental schedule in the financial statement. So it's not part of the financial statements, it's a supplemental schedule. So it's towards the end of the CAFR. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the bottom line as I understand it is we're uh, tasked to review how the money was spent mm -hmm. um, and report that to the council but we have no mandate or ability to direct how the money should be spent. It's simply to say, uh, here's what the ordinance said, here's where the money went, um, it went to the right place or the wrong place, pass it on to the council, and then we're done. We don't have any uh, power to do anything other than report whether they're sticking with uh, what was promised. Um, Essentially, that's correct, yes. Yeah, okay. Mr. Spaulding, can you clarify too, as an advisory committee though, um, what is the difference of reviewing and basically blessing what the city council and the city city staff did? Um, does an advisory committee have the allowance to say as citizens and part of this committee, we would like to see X? I mean, what- Absolutely. In the annual report and, and the last of the scopes and duties as, as contained in resolution, uh, I think it's 50, 4257, mm -hmm. uh, the council, the committee based on analysis of future trends and how the city has spent money in the past may make future recommendations to the council. They, they won't have any more weight other than as a recommendation, but it's right. within your authority to make such a recommendation. Yes. Okay. And we just, because it's a new committee, we haven't really had that opportunity yet, but going forward, we will be able to wait. Right. right. And my understanding too was one of the reasons this is slow to get going is because, uh, and the, the member from HDL can probably attest to this, is it takes a while to develop any of the, any of the income or revenue streams and see what exactly Measure U has done. And for a significant period of time, I mean, once that, once Measure U passed, we had approximately, I think it was four to seven months before CDTFA even collected any taxes, let alone could we see where they went or how they were acquired and whatnot. So there was a bit of a year, there was approximately nine months to a year lag time before we had any data to share. Yeah, that's correct. It, it, uh, initial implementation of the measure takes time to get the data together and recorded from CDTFA. And so um, there is that delay. And then in this case, it, and what, I've, what I've seen is um, cities with long-term measures, transaction and use tax measures over time in several years, you see a very comparable pattern in all of the different major industry groups, the spending patterns are very comparable, but this one, not only is it relatively new going back only nine quarters, but you had COVID happening during the same time period. So there's definitely a benefit to, I think, having waited to now having this snapshot in time. It's a good time period for your committee to reconvene, I think. I have a question about our recommendations, and this is uh, Mr. Spaulding. Um, I believe last month, the thing came out in front of the city council where um, it was 
they're trying to figure out who lived far enough away to vote on anything uh, from a proposal that was going down. Um, my concern is, is that um, many of us live close to parks and recreation um, areas and things like that. Um, and that I guess I need to know what we're able to comment on uh, in, a, in our official capacity in terms of recommendations. Um, right. You're referring, you're referring to the real property materiality standards yes. and political yeah. reform act regulations. Um, yeah. and did you receive my email response to you yesterday, I believe? Uh, I didn't get it. I, I know I sent something in to, to Christy to send to you because I couldn't find the contact information. So I didn't okay. get that. Okay, I had responded to you yesterday afternoon. Let me know if you receive that. I can put something together for the rest of the committee. But given the fact that this is an advisory committee and the types of things that this committee is going to be discussing, it's very unlikely we're going to encounter that specific Political Reform Act prohibition. Okay. Um, it, essentially, the real property uh, material interest standards and whatnot apply whenever you're making a decision that would change the nature, character, or market value of the official's parcel or affect a property in close proximity to that parcel. So where we really start to see this is we see this in like um, rezoning and whatnot, where it might increase the economic benefit of the official's parcel if, let's say, it could be, you know, an ADU could be built on it and, and increase its rental value. Things things of that nature or, or change in... Um, uh, change in parking rules, uh, things that we're looking for that would actually change the, the, the value of the property or its value to a developer. Um, given the fact that much of what Measure U is focused on is broad, kind of citywide measures, um, the likelihood that we're talking about something so specific that it would have any measurable effect on an official's, on an official's property value uh, to rise to the level of a material conflict of interest is, is unlikely. Um, however, it is possible. Miranda Park comes to mind because that seems to be a, a very uh, highly debated area within the city. Same with Volker. Um, it's entirely possible this committee could, could have discussions and make recommendations that are very specific to, let's say, Volker or Miranda. If that were the case, uh, committee members who live less than 500 feet and potentially even less than a thousand feet from that park could have to consider recusing themselves based on the nature of what's being suggested. But considering measure U is simply rubber, this committee is, is to some extent just rubber stamping past decisions and making broad general recommendations for future use. It, it seems unlikely that we're going to run into any of those materiality standards affecting real property interests. Okay, so for example, using that, I live next to Miranda Park and I have a property over next to Bolker. So it, it sounds like if I was, was wanting to advocate for bathrooms at Bolker Park or you know fixing the fields at Miranda Park, that's something I shouldn't do, right? Right. That is something that you should not use your position to advocate for or against. That okay. being said, nothing would prevent you from advocating for things that are generally applicable, like increased park amenities citywide. Okay, got it. Okay, so I need to stay out of uh, anything within 500 feet of my home, okay? Because I, right. I, I, I people live at the beach, and it's like, uh, this gets tricky. <laughs> right, and we also need to consider that the nature and quality of the action would have to be something that has a reasonably foreseeable effect on market value or the highest and best use of a property. Okay. So uh, lighting or bathrooms, uh, does a bathroom at Bulker Park increase the market value of your house? Is it reasonably foreseeable? And, and the problem that we get into with the Political Reform Act, and I'll, I'll give a couple of admonishments. One, as you can just see from me posing that question, it's very philosophical, it's very fact-based. Would a bathroom actually have any material effect on, on property values? Probably not. Would increased parking at Bulker Park affect property values? Well, now you've got changes in traffic density, you've got changes in neighborhood. Maybe it would, maybe it would harm. And so the thing is, is that when we start looking at the, at the specific factual circumstances that surround a conflicts analysis, they get really fact sensitive. 
The other thing that I have to caution you against is that there is a defense called, a, you know, reliance upon advice of counsel. It's important to note that I represent the city and I represent this body as, as, a, as an organization within the city. I have zero attorney-client relationship with any of the members of this body or with individual council members. My goal, my, 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 my allegiance is to a fictitious entity as if it were a person. So yeah, I, what, what's, I what's fascinating, what's fascinating under that is that you cannot rely on my advice and the FPPC, the, the commission in charge of enforcing the Political Reform Act, has specifically said that reliance on the advice of attorney is not enough to warrant off a Political Reform Act violation. So I can <laughs> do my best and I can give you my thoughts on the matter, but you are not entitled to rely on. Got it. Okay, I, I just need to stay out of all this then. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the other que the other question was, I know what, what happened with the city council thing was you, somebody got a map out and drew a circle around it and they could see whether they could vote on on something. Um, so I have no yes. idea how 500 feet is. So I can, I can contact, Brad and I can discuss this offline and perhaps we can use the city's GIS system to create a radius map. We've done something similar with council members. Um, that, that I, I'm sure really, we would be able to do something really like that. For, I think for all of us, that would be really helpful. And then Brad and I will communicate offline and, and see if we can provide that for you. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I have a question regarding the Measure U General Fund re uh, Revenue and Expenditure Report. Um, it looks like a lot of money was brought in, over $3 million. Is that correct? 0.6 million. Are we moving to the next uh, report? We're, we're only looking at 2.1, 2 which is um, page three of your handout. Madam Chair, City Manager, would it uh, uh, be okay if... Um, I was uh, looking Mrs. Terrell up. just went through the uh, presented these documents and then um, questions can be addressed uh, after she's reviewed them and provide the details. Perfect. So she's going to go through two document one, two, and three, and then at the end we can vote on receiving and filing them and accepting them. Yes, ma'am. We've sure. had an opportunity because they, yeah, because we need to understand what we're looking at. That would probably be helpful. Okay. So here is, this is the um, General Fund Revenue and Expenditure Report for fiscal year ending in June 30th of 2021. So now these numbers have not been audited just yet. Our audit is about to begin uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, but what we have here for 2021, we ended the year with total revenue from Measure U of 3,255,918. And then as uh, was mentioned earlier, since we ended fiscal year 2020. Um, beginning of 2021, we have established a project code to track the Measure U expenditures. So you'll see that the um, expenditures that are noted on here are a little bit more comprehensive in nature and the categories that are provided. And that's because we have a tracking mechanism to track specific projects. Um, if I can go through this public safety, the total public safety expenditures are a million two hundred seven one seven three, and then a streets and maintenance category, and you can see the different projects. So now these are projects, and all these numbers were derived from invoices that we have paid against these projects. Uh, the total streets and maintenance is three hundred and forty-six thousand five hundred and sixty dollars, and the next category is parks and recreation, and again these are the projects that we have worked on, and these are the amounts that have been spent or that were spent, I should say, for fiscal year 2021. And those uh, amount to 346,328.51 uh, under parks and recreation category. In total, total Measure U expenditures are $1.9 million. And as we saw, the revenue up above is uh, $3.2 million. And so we have about 1.3, 1355, 1.3 million that um, we have excess revenues over expenditures. And those um, are going to be used. We have projects that we have not completed yet. And this will be my next slide here, my next uh, report. 
So these are Measure U projects that are in progress. And you can see the um, public works. We have $25,000. Under police, we have a total of 270000 And then parks and recreations what has quite a number of projects that are ongoing and that were carried over to this fiscal year. And that amounts to 874000 And then the last category are facilities and maintenance. And um, those projects amount to 186856 So in total, the total of the projects will uh, basically use up the funds that we have left over uh, from the fiscal year that just ended. Um, and again, we're tracking these projects, each one. You can see that the projects now have a project number, mm -hmm. and they also have a project code of measure U. So we'll, we know exactly how much is being spent on each project. Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, what is a CAD, CAD yeah. enterprise system under police? Is that some mm -hmm. software situation, or you know what that is? Yeah. That's a, a situation with their dispatch system, uh, computer-aided dispatch, and so it, um, um, it improves and it creates interoperability between not only um, internal um, uh, police communications, but also uh, external, especially with the uh, Oxnard Police. Uh, so it's a significant up upgrade in our dispatching capability. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and Madam Chair, City Manager Connors, if I may just um, add one more comment associated with this particular batch of information. All the projects in here were uh, part of a um, 2021 uh, CIP program, and um, that program was under executed for a variety of different reasons. So um, all of these projects were uh, moved um, or carried forward into the current, current uh, two-year budget, and that's why we've uh, retained them as Measure uh, U expenditures. So I have a question. If it's a two-year budget, the revenue is a two-year revenue or a yearly revenue? The measure U, is that yearly or is that a two-year? Is that if this is a two-year budget, is the measure U revenue for two years or one year? No, the revenue here is for one year. So this revenue is for fiscal year that ended in 20 June 2021, the 3.2. Okay. So for right. one year. Okay. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that um the the uh reserves um, are exactly the same amount of money as your ongoing projects. Just rolled forward. That was interesting. Yeah, yeah, how that just rolled out exactly. One mail, 355. Um, I have a question. I have a question regarding the funds that come into the city. Um, are they, uh, do you, is there ever any interest that's made on any of these funds that come into the city that you can fall back on? Or is it just this set of money and then it just stays that way? Or can you reinvest it to get interest on it? Uh, this is, I have no idea if this is something you can do. You know, all these, money to uh, make money. <laughs> all, all measure you goes into the general fund um, and it's, um, I mean, it, the potential it exists to put it in a uh, treasury account, um, which has interest uh, bearing cap cap capability. But most ones are, are part of working capital, and so they're they're, they're uh, extremely liquid to buy down expenses. The comment about the you know the exact match, but that's because we don't I mean, we're based on uh, when we do the budget um, development and assign expenses to measure you. We are using a forecast number. So if the, uh, for example, the forecast number that we're using was somewhere around $2.3 million um, and it was uh, it was three point, um, whatever it was, $3 million, which means we had to go back into our expenses and find uh, expenses uh, in capital projects that met um, the the intent or the uh, um, the commitments uh, represented in a resolution. And so this will occur uh, every time we go through a cycle of, of Measure U. Um, and so the exact amount of Measure U is not static. And so we do, we revisit uh, each year and then we assign uh, expenses to that amount. And that's why it came out exactly the same. Good. That's awesome that the city is able to do all this. That's wonderful. Any other questions?
No. Committee members, no more questions. Are we ready to uh, vote on accepting these reports? Receive and file, etc. Anybody have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I would like to make one comment. Okay. Um, it, it seemed like in the prior year, the police department got 93% of the money, which seemed way out of balance. The second uh, year looks much better to me. It, it's, it's, uh, we're doing a lot of projects that are in different areas other than the police department. And I, I support the police department just in the, the first one. Um, all, all the money went one place. Uh, now it looks like it's being spread out better, which is, I think, better. Yeah, and part of the reason is because we didn't have a project code to identify those expenditures. So I'm sure there were expenses in the prior year related to Measure U, but we didn't have a specific project code. So the way okay. the, the expenses were allocated were different. Yes. And Madam Chair, City Manager, if I could just add a little bit more commentary to it. Um, um, we took a, a uh, an emphasis and effort um, in the lead end uh, of budgeting to identify those expenses and allocate those around those five categories uh, that um, are uh, included in the, the resolution so that we can distribute those um, and account for those um, in a way that lives up to the expectations that we've represented in their re resolution. So this is now by design going into the budget build that we, um, we, we are allocating um, as close as we can um, to multiple uh, elements um, in our expenses uh, in, the, in the budget and uh, allocated in alignment with the resolution. Uh, I have a question regarding the playground hardware and fiber fall. Does anybody know what that is all about? That's under Parks and Recreation for 15000 I'm sorry, Sharon, can you uh, ask that question one more time? Yeah, uh, under Parks and Recreation, you have Playground Hardware and Fiber Fall for 15393 Just, I have, what it, what what was that? I, new playground equipment? Um, just uh, curious to what it was. Yeah, it's both replacement parts in the playground equipment, and then the Fiber Fall is a reference to the surfacing material that gets replaced annually uh, underneath to, for fall protection. I see, that's what, okay, cool, good, beautiful. Thank you. I move that we accept. Both that. That. Are we ready for the roll call vote? Any more questions? <laughs> Going one. Yeah, I, I, hear a, I hear a motion from, uh, from one of the members. Is there a second? I second it. David Scripper seconds. Okay. I agree as well. Do a roll call vote. So Member Diaz Conte is still uh, absent for the record. Uh, Member Mendez. I accept it. Uh, Member Claris. I accept it. Vice Chair Scribner. Yes. And Chair Taylor. Accepted. Motion passes unanimously. Perfect. Great. Well, I for one am very excited that we finally got together. Um, looking forward to continuing this with everybody. Um, are we going to um, schedule our next meeting or are we going to wait to the beginning of the year? What do you think, Don? I, I defer to the city manager and uh, the finance committee person, uh, chair, uh, because I'm not sure what the city's timetable going forward. I know Mr. Connor said we we're going to meet quarterly. It will probably be nice to schedule it now, but. What I can do is I can send some dates. I'll coordinate with HDL and I can schedule dates after we have the presentation from HDL so that it coincides with the, the press. So we have the, the information from them and I can send a couple of dates um, to all of you if that works. Okay. If, if, I, if, if I may, Madam Chair, um, um, we do an annual master calendar for council meetings. Um, we'll also do one for the city advisory commission so we have hard dates every quarter, um, as well as measure U. So those dates um, will be part of a package that will present the council. 
and the, the dates for the Measure U will be reflective of our, of our usual um, HDL updates. So those things are timed in sequence so that we have the latest information um, up to at least one, one previous quarter's currency. Okay. That would be very helpful to be have a ongoing calendar that aligns with the city council. And also I, as chair, um, I'm not really positive. So it appears that I was supposed to take roll call and all that. Who, who's actually like um, doing the roll call vote? It, it seemed to go back and forth and I'm not really clear on what my role is or whoever the future chair <laughs> is. Yeah. In in future meetings, it's usually conducted by the city clerk who is absent today. Okay. Oh. And so that's that's typically the way that it goes down. That's probably the reason for some of the the disjointedness is everybody's kind of assuming different roles than they normally have in these meetings. <laughs> okay. And that we haven't had one for a very long time, so I was just seeking clarification on on who takes role and and calls for the vote and all that. Yeah, to clarify, under Rosenberg's rules, typically the way that it happens is taking role for the taking role in roll call votes is usually the the province of the city clerk or agency clerk. Okay. Um, with respect to announcement of the agenda items, that responsibility falls to the chair. Um, chair should also introduce the staff uh, to give a report at the start of an agenda item, and then invite questions of staff. And then uh, usually there's an invitation for motions and seconds. And then discussion followed by a vote. Once there is motion and second on a vote, then the city clerk would re-enter and take the roll call vote. So you're saying that at the next meeting, the chair would do the roll call vote and all that. Well, that the, the the chair would would follow Rosenberg's rules in in bringing forth the agenda item, which usually is like. You know, we're on agenda item number one: HDL company's presentation okay. on Measure U, and then introduce. You know, uh, would Mr. Uh, Lloyd Diamas, you know, uh, give the give the presentation? Obviously, we didn't we didn't have him at the moment, but um, that's that's sim sim similar to how it happens. And then it's mainly controlling the flow of discussion. So it's first we hear from staff, then committee members get to ask comments of staff, followed by usually, in my opinion, it should be followed by a motion. Do I have any motions? Uh, and then once you have motions and seconds, then the committee members may discuss amongst themselves, uh, weigh the pros and cons of whatever motions. And then when it's time to have a roll call vote, uh, the city clerk will will start with the latest motion on the table and move backwards as appropriate. Okay. And then as far as developing the agenda, city staff does that because we just basically got it and, you know, didn't have any input on the on this particular one. I assume it's that way going forward. Yes, it is. It's usually a, a, a point of contention with members on Brown Act bodies. Unfortunately, uh, any discussion or any any conversation about the agenda has to take place in an open meeting during an agenda item for that very purpose. Okay. So it, it, the Brown Act, the, the Brown Act really makes it difficult. So again, the city staff prepares the agenda and then once the city clerk opens the meeting, then whoever's the chair just runs it based on city staff's um, recommendation that business item number one. So next time I would say, okay, we're on HDL presentation and then we let uh, the presenter speak and then we ask for questions and then we vote. That chair does all that. Is that correct? That's that's correct. And and before the next meeting, if if you're so inclined, uh, feel free to reach out to myself and Christy, and we can give you a, a script to go through, or um, a kind of a general way of handling it. As long as it's one on one, we don't run a foul of Brown Act. Right. So we'd be we'd be free to talk with you outside of the meeting. Okay. Yeah, because it's just been a very long time uh, since we had our formation meeting over a year, and we've never had an operating meeting, so. Yeah, that it was just kind of on the fly this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we got it done. <laughs> it worked. Yes, we did. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. So are we are we ready to adjourn the meeting? I'm ready. <laughs> and we do not need a vote to adjourn. The chair may simply adjourn. Yeah. Maybe okay. we can adjourn at this time.
All right, I make a motion that we adjourn the meeting at 3.35. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lou.